Next, we hear a special from the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library in which former Governor Jim Edgar discusses the early years of his political career, his time as Secretary of State, and the contemplation of his run for governor. This runs about one hour and 20 minutes. Well, your first endeavor once you actually got into politics, I know, was an internship. And you've told me before how important that was. But can you tell me just a little bit about that experience? Well, from a, again, it was important for me because it, it got me into Springfield. I came out of a family that was not political. I mean, if anything, my parents were Democrats. And, uh, you know, I was always kind of... My mother had worried she'd drop me on my head when I was a baby because she couldn't understand why I had such an interest in politics. But I really didn't have connections with the party, per se. I mean, I had, you know, connections in student government, but that's different than partisan politics. So the internship uh, got me to Springfield and got me involved in, in real partisan politics and government. Uh, it was an interesting, uh, everybody had told me, well, if you want to be in politics, you ought to go into law. Now, I had a history major, uh, political science minor. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot I could do with that. Uh, but they said, go to law school. Well, I didn't really want to be a lawyer, but I applied to law school. Same day I got accepted to U of I Law School in the afternoon, I'd also uh, uh, applied for the legislative internship, which I didn't think I would get because they had never taken people straight out of undergraduates before. And nobody from Eastern had ever been picked. So uh, I got picked in the afternoon for that. and. Uh, it took me about one-tenth of a second to decide I'm going to take the internship over law school. And, and one of the reasons was, too, the internship paid. And uh, I don't want people to think all we worried about was money, but we didn't have any money when we got married. So we, I mean, we worried about it. And, you know, I, I thought here I could do something I wanted to do, plus they were going to pay me. Going to law school, I didn't sure I really wanted to go to law school or be a lawyer, and I was going to have to pay them. So the internship... Uh, Short term, it was very important because we got paid. Long term, it, it got me connected with people in government that uh, proved to be very important uh, in the rest of my career. I think for Brenda, and she'll have to tell you, it was an interesting, I remember when I told her we we're going to go to Springfield. Well, now wait, let's back up because it was an exciting day when the, they sent a telegram. Yeah. Uh, so I hurried over and found you yeah. on campus and, and showed him the telegram and that was, we had, was really exciting and a happy um, moment. Uh, but then so it so, yeah, you were excited, but then it dawned So you were better off with him taking the internship than law school as well? Yes, it was the right thing for the, the time. It was right. But then it dawned on her, we're going to have to move to Springfield. And she, I remember she said, I can't ever drive in Springfield. It's too much traffic, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> Because we, you know, but I learned to she, drive. You, in you learned to drive in Springfield, but you were a little apprehensive about. We thought this is the big city coming to Springfield. I mean, she had grown up in Metropolis and Anna, and I'd grown up in Charleston, and we could count the number of stoplights in our town on one hand. And so, you know, we came to Springfield. This was this was the big city. They had four or five movie theaters. I mean, there was just all kinds of things going on. Well, it had to be a great opportunity as well to be working with a couple of the most skilled politicians in Illinois at the time. Well, I, you know, as legislative interns, we got assigned. It's a little different than how they do it now. Now you get picked by the caucus staff. Uh, then we were picked by the academics. And then the caucus staffs would look at who the academics had picked and then choose who would be their interns. And I got assigned to a gentleman named W. Russell Arrington, who was the uh, Republican leader in the Senate. And he was the power in the legislature. I mean, I always say that... Uh, Mike Madigan is the Arrington of today, or at least the good things about Mike Madigan is the Arrington of today. Arrington was a very progressive, uh, conservative Republican. You may not think those two words go together, but he particularly wanted to develop staffing. He wanted to bring in young people and have them, in a professional way, deal with the issues before state government and work with the legislature. So it turned out to be the perfect person to get assigned to, though I was scared to death of him. I mean, he was uh, Mayor Daley, the original Mayor Daley, always referred to him as Arrogant Arrington because he, he did not suffer fools well. He uh, was a very uh, determined was demanding. individual. Yeah, yeah, demanding. And, uh, you know, for somebody fresh out of college from downstate Illinois, you all of a sudden get thrusted in with him, and 
he used to have me write letters, and I'm a terrible speller. And I used to scare me to death when he'd read my letters, because he, he would find any little mistake. And, uh, but it turned out to be a, a great opportunity, that internship with Senator Arrington. I know that uh, after you worked with Arrington for a while, you moved to the House and had the experience with Robert Blair yeah. as well. Arrington, uh, the, the two years, it was two years with Arrington uh, when he sponsored the income tax, did a lot of things. So that was very exciting. But then he suffered a stroke uh, right after the 1970 election and uh, really never, re he came back, but he, he never came back as the, as the person he was before. He was... He had trouble with his speech, and he had to use a cane and a wheelchair often. And so he just made cameo appearances the next two years. And uh, the Speaker of the House was a gentleman named Debbie Rupp, uh, Robert Blair. And he was kind of the young up-and-comer and, -comer and uh, wanted to put the staff together. And I remember he came over to Arrington when before Arrington had his stroke and said, you know, Senator, I want to put a staff together like you have. I wonder if I'd be able to maybe hire some of your staff. And, Arrington says, you don't touch my staff, you know. <laughs> and uh, But after he had the stroke, then I could go ahead and go over. And uh, so I did that for a couple of years. And that was an interesting time in the House. And for Brenda, uh, I you guess... you still under an internship at that time? No, I, I was a staffer. At, at the end of the first year, uh, Arrington asked me to come on his staff full time. And that required us to move to Cook County. Now, we're, he, his offices were downtown Chicago. He was from Evanston, so I had to move up there. But uh, needless to say, Brenda was really, and I was a little nervous about moving up, up yeah, to the... Yeah, that's a really, bit bigger than Springfield. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, to the we really were big city. Well, we, going we, to the city. Yeah, we lived in Park Forest. And uh, it was the Park Forest was right on the county line uh, between Cook and Will. So somebody said, it's the closest I could be to downstate, you know, <laughs> and, and be in Cook County. What this required of Jim was that he walked to... Um, the bus stop, caught the bus, took the bus to the train station, took the train downtown, walked, what, a mile uh, onto Arrington's office, and then reversed it coming home. So by, it was quite a sacrifice on his part to live that far south of the city and um, But for Brenda, I think where we lived was kind of an ideal was, spot. It was, it was good. We lived in a, Park Four. Forest uh, was one of the first planned communities in America after World War II. And, we lived in what they call the co-ops, these nice townhouses, plenty of room for mm -hmm. what little we had to pay at that time. We didn't have much money to pay anyway. But uh, but there were a lot of other people in the neighborhood whose husbands were traveling, and there were wives there with small children. So it was probably a, the ideal place for us to live uh, in that area. And I also have to say that that two years almost that I we lived in Park Forest, that taking the IC train downtown every day gave me a little better appreciation of life in the urban area and the importance of mass transportation, particularly when those IC trains would stop in the middle of the summer. They didn't have air conditioning. These are really old cars. They went back to the 20s. And uh, you would stop out in the middle of nowhere with the sun beating down on you. Then you, I understood why they used to tell about stoppage of the CTA or the trains, why that mattered, mm -hmm. because if you're stuck in that. Uh, but it, that was a good experience for me to, you know, I was downtown in the loop every day and uh, got to have uh, an appreciation for another part of Illinois that neither one of us had ever been exposed to. I know that you didn't waste too much time to decide to actually throw your hat in the ring and run for office. It was 1974, so you were still very young at the time, still a young couple at the time. Mm -hmm. We were, uh, we had uh, in 70, uh, the end of 72, uh, excuse me, the end of 70, my date's right, end of 70, uh, we, I guess we were up in Park Forest for about a year and a half. I talked to Arrington before he had a stroke to let me come back to Springfield because I really did not want to, we just wanted to be back in Springfield. And I wanted to be in the state capitol. I thought that was better than commuting. And so uh, we moved back to Springfield and then went to work for Blair, uh, and we purchased our first home. Uh, I was making a good salary. I mean, I was, I was well paid for state government at that time, particularly for someone who was 24 years old, uh, very well paid. And uh, we bought our first home out in Chatham. And uh, I think uh, we, we had a, I wouldn't say it was a normal life. I was gone a lot, but 
a pretty normal life, and we had a nice home, and we had neighbors that were good friends, still good friends to today. Uh, so I think Brenda liked that life, liked that. And all I, you know, she, I came home and said, you know, we're going to move to Charleston, my hometown, not her hometown, and I'm going to run for office. So she had to leave her friends, uh, go back without a paycheck because I wouldn't be able to stay on the state payroll while I ran. And, uh, you know, she had to uh, adjust to a new town that was my town and listen to all the, the Jim Edgar stories, you know. Uh, and so for me is what I wanted to do. For her, I think it was a very, very big uh, sacrifice. And I'll, I'll let okay. her give her side. I'm of adept at, at adjusting because we, we've had a lot of adjustments in our married life, a lot of moving, quite a lot of moving. What's the number you used to? Oh, I, like, oh, well over 20 moves. Does that mean that you learn how not to collect too many things as you move from one place to another? Well, you know, I learned how to, not to collect things, but ah. someone else in our family <laughs> is a, yeah, a collector of many things. I'm a pack rat. I keep it everything. is a pack rat. Well, by this time, you've got a young family as well, don't you? Right. Well, let me think. Where are we moving well, to Charleston? You got our Brad daughter was and, and, uh, and you're, uh, expecting our second child when we moved back yeah, to okay. Charleston. So she was born um, in Charleston. Well, that's a well, challenge, just moving while you're pregnant in the first place. That's right. Especially when I think the movers were coming the next day and Jim was in some really important meeting. It was the end meeting. of the legislative session. Mm -hmm. Now, by this time in the marriage, you had to know that his real passion was politics and running for office. So what did you think about that first experience? How well did you think you learned to be a, a on the campaign trail, let's put it that way? I think I did pretty well uh, the first time, although it, it was a primary, and that's such a different campaign than a general mm -hmm. election campaign. So we're running in a primary from a, uh, we've just returned, the other person was more established in town and had a... Well, it was tough for her, yeah, Brenda, because she was, was pregnant. And then early in the campaign, about maybe a week after I formally announced, Elizabeth was born. She was born cesarean. So, yeah, you know, it took a while to bounce back from that. Well, I'm in a very tough race, uh, a race that I ended up losing, but and I knew it was going to be tough. And, you know, we're trying to just... Brenda's trying to adjust to this new environment. Plus, you know, she had Elizabeth, a small baby. Brad, at that point, was, I think, five. Uh, and uh, I was tough. And, of course, this was a tough campaign, and I would come home, and I'm not one who uh, hides my emotions. Uh, and, uh, you know, that had to be trying for her. And she, she got out and campaigned as much as she could with a newborn child and, uh, you know, a, a five-year-old. And I thought it did very good. But it... I think of all the campaigns that I was involved in, that had to be the hardest on Brenda. Uh, and it's, it's probably, um, I'm very fortunate she just didn't leave <laughs> at that point and tell me you were on your own. One of the things about politics, I, you know, I knew about state government. I probably knew as much about it as anybody first-time candidate for the state legislature. Uh, but that's not what gets you elected. You've got to know people. You've got to have contacts. You, you've got to be... Uh, outgoing and be able to, to do a lot of the things that I'd never learned in political. You don't, they don't teach you that in political science. And I really didn't do that in Springfield. Uh, the gentleman I was running against uh, who had never been in Springfield much, didn't know anything really about state government, but he was on the county board. Uh, he had been elected. He was had a business in town. He was a member of Kiwanis. So he was very well established. His family was very well established. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of on my own. And People who maybe knew me before I left Charleston to go to Springfield might have remembered me as a high school student or a college student. I don't think they thought of me as an adult who ought to be maybe their state legislator. So I had to deal with that and uh, try to impress them that I, I, I knew what it was all about and they needed to zero in on that. But again, people vote more on character and on personalities than they do on issues, I think. And uh, did you have a stump speech that you used? Uh, not really. Uh, you didn't get around and do all that many speeches. You go out and meet people individually. You know, I would sometimes uh, go to uh, Kiwanis, uh, Lions, or Rotary clubs like that, but then you had to be careful not to be too partisan. Uh, if they had a candidate's night, then all of you would be there. You'd have maybe two minutes to get up and 
try to convince them you were the best candidate. Uh, we had a few, you know, ask the candidate questions, but nobody turned out for those. Well, I remember you told me a story when you were in high school, I believe, maybe even junior high, about junior Frosty. High, yeah. Yeah, well, not that we need to tell that now. I would encourage people to go to the interview, but uh, you learned early on the importance of at least being ready with, oh, with yeah. some comments. No, no, I, I never, that was, I, I learned that early, uh, <laughs> the other election I lost. And, uh, you know, I learned that if you're going to go speak, be prepared, know kind of what you're going to say, have an outline at least. And, uh, you know, I was always nervous about it, but be truthful, my opponent really had not done much public speaking. I mean, he so I, it wasn't like I was too worried about that, and I knew more about the issues. But as I found in that first campaign, particularly in a primary, issues aren't the big issue. Uh, it's family, it's uh, who you know, uh, who's been with you before, uh, a lot of issues that, a lot of factors that I hadn't realized. The other most important thing I probably learned that first election, besides the fact you can lose and you never want to lose again, is that it's retail politics and you've got to go out and meet people. And I had a, I was somewhat of an introvert, and I remember going to this first very big political gathering, you didn't go with me, I was up in Vermilion County, and uh, it was the county chairman's home, and he invited all the people in Vermilion County, the party people, and that's the big county in the district, and then invited the, the prospective candidates up. Well, my opponent was there, and I'm there, and he worked there, he went around and shook hands with everybody in the room. Well, I thought that was impolite to go up and stick your hands out to strangers, so I kind of stood over in the corner and figured, well, if people wanted to meet me, they'd come over and meet me. Well, needless to say, that did not make a good impression. And that kind of, I had that kind of rap through the campaign, well, he's a little stiff, you know, and probably had that throughout my career. Uh, but I did learn after that first campaign, y you shake hands with everybody you can find to shake hands. That's what people, particularly in a primary, that's what they expect you to do. And but I had to kind of learn the hard way because we, uh, I found out later, none of the party people gave me a chance. They didn't think I was going to, they thought I was just going to get wiped out. And it was a very close election. There were three of us running for two spots and uh, the incumbent legislator from Vermilion County, the big county, I almost beat him. The other guy ran a little bit ahead of him and then the incumbent ran a little bit mm -hmm. ahead of me. But uh, it, well, was a, it was a great experience. I didn't think so at the time. Losing, that night I lost. Uh, was one of the more difficult nights in my life. Well, that's my next question. What did you think about your future at that moment? Well, I'm sure Brenda was relieved in some ways. Uh, I was devastated. I mean, because, you know, I knew it was going to be a tough race, but I thought this was my only chance because I had moved back to Charleston. There wasn't anything for me to do in Charleston if I wasn't a state legislator. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I couldn't practice law. Uh, I don't have a Ph.D., so I couldn't teach at Eastern. Uh, there really wasn't, and I didn't even have a teaching certificate. So in a nutshell, he thought his political career was over at and, age 27. And what did you think about him losing that first race? I was sorry for Jim that he lost because I knew that he, I knew that he was the better candidate, not in performance as a candidate, but I knew he would be a better uh, representative. Um, but at the same time, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to him because he learned some lessons in that and losing that you can't learn any other way. And but it so sounds that was like, good for him. It sounds like his prospects weren't all that great if he stays in Charleston, though. No, I think, I mean, I had to do, I, I couldn't stay in Charleston. We either had to go okay. back to Springfield or find okay. some other field. But the one thing that fortunately I did, uh, I had basically run against the party, the local party. And uh, after the primary, because this has been a tight, right, tough, we'd split the town in half, split the county in half. I carried part of the county, the other guy carried the other. But I brought a lot of new people in to the political process, a lot of young people. And the, the party uh, leaders, they, they didn't want me to kind of go home, take my bat and ball and be mad at all my people, because this was 1974, and that's the Watergate year. And mm -hmm. everybody knew it was going to be a tough year for Republicans. So uh, they uh, came to me and asked me, would I be the party treasurer? Now, I really didn't want to be the party treasurer, but I thought, well, you know, maybe I ought to not take my bat and ball and go home, and I ought to help out. So the county chairman who had opposed me during the election, and I got to be very good friends during that race, and we worked on electing Republicans, including the guy that beat me. 
And I'll never forget the day of the election. Uh, one of the, the major local papers had an article saying about me, saying, well, on election day, you know, Jim Edgar's not going to be a candidate like he'd hoped to be, but he's out there helping the rest of the party, and uh, he and the, the party people really appreciate the fact he stuck in there. Well, that pretty well cemented if I got another chance, they'd be for me. So one of the things I always tell people about politics is when you run, and even if you lose, it's not a waste because you learn a lot, but you also, people get to know you. And, you know, two years later, much to my surprise, uh, I got a chance to run again. And the reason I didn't have any opposition was because I ran the first time. And I also didn't take my bat and ball and go home, but I stayed. And for the party people, that was far more important than the fact that I knew everything about the state legislature and about what's going on in Springfield. The fact that I'd kind of now earned it from the party's mm -hmm. perspective, uh, that was uh, very important. I didn't, again, didn't know it at the time. Uh, I, uh, we, we, I worked in Springfield a little bit part-time after that election, and then at the end of that year, got a job with the National Conference of State Legislature, and uh, then we moved to Colorado. The first of many opportunities to go to Colorado. That's right. And did it take you very long? I, I know you love Colorado, so did it take you very long to decide this was a great place to come? It was a wonderful place to live. And we lived there for how many months? Four? Four months, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you barely got on Before we moved again. <laughs> yeah, well, the, uh, I, I took the job, and for the first six months, I commuted from Charleston around the country. I had to go around. To, I think I was in 40 different states. Mm -hmm in the capitals talking to legislators because we were just setting up the organization. I had to convince them to give us money. Uh, then uh, we moved the headquarters formally to Denver in the 1st of July and uh, I went out there and then Brenda followed about a month later. Uh, we hadn't sold our house in Charleston uh, and uh, we had a new house in uh, Colorado out in the suburbs. Beautiful smaller home had a view of the mountains. I mean, it was a really nice, nice place. And uh, and I was gone all the time, but at least I was leaving more money at home than I was <laughs> when I was unemployed after I lost that election. And uh, I really didn't think I would get another shot. And one of the things I've, I've learned that you, you never can predict what's going to happen mm -hmm. in politics. Now, Brenda always, I think, thought I might get another shot. I didn't. I thought I was done. Uh, but I just happened to be, I think it was in October, I happened to be traveling through Springfield, uh, visiting the legislature when the senator from our district announced he was retiring and the guy that had beat me for state rep who was about my age, I didn't think he'd ever leave that job, he announced for the Senate and I put out a press release saying I was running for the House and then I called Brenda and said I'll be home in about three hours, could you pick me up at the Denver airport? Oh, by the way, I just announced for the Illinois House. <laughs> Long pause. And as I've said, that long pause, I think, lasted for several years because, uh, you know, she was just stunned because she was just about got unpacked and here we we're going to move again. Well, it is, a, you know, politics is a matter of timing, though, isn't it? Oh, well, yeah. yeah. It's, it, you know, again, I, I think it was meant to be. I just happened to be in Springfield that day mm -hmm. when that all occurred and, you know, I was able to get the press release out. And uh, it was probably good. I then went back to Colorado because some of the party leaders tried to move this guy back to the House, not run for the Senate, and they wanted me to get out. But as long as the two of us weren't in the room together, we could always say, well, the other guy hasn't changed, so we're not going to change. And we were able to kind of work past filing date. And uh, But no, that, you know, if I hadn't, have, I think, come back and run, I really doubt if I would have ever been back and been in politics. Well, I want to move forward and... and talk about after you've won the election and you've gone to the legislature, uh, a couple questions. First of all, did you, did you have a residence in Charleston or in Springfield or both during that time? No, just in Charleston at that time. It's very uncommon for wives to come, particularly when they have children. Now, some of the older couples, if the children are gone, uh, the wife might come and spend some time in Springfield. But uh, with two small children, I mean, Brenda had her hands full. Now, we, we did have a place in Springfield. She just never recognized it. We had a mobile home <laughs> that uh, was left a lot to be Not desired. Not your favorite place to no, live. No, it at. wasn't. The, the, first, the one time I got Jim's her... Jim's home. <laughs> the one time I got her over there, it was uh, for Jim Thompson's inauguration. It was right before I was sworn in. And, and uh, it turned real cold. I mean, they had to call off the parade and everything. And 
have it in. Back then, they used to have it outside. And anyway, uh, I remember we went to the tr trailer. The pipes had frozen, and the next morning she saw a mouse, and so she never came it back. It was freezing in there. Yeah, just freezing. So she she never Apparently came back. Apparently, the mouse was doing fine. Yeah, though. he was happy, but yeah. I wasn't. <laughs> Well, what did you think about being a legislator? Was it all that you expected it to well, be? Well, I mean, after being the chief aide to the speaker and the chief aide, you know, to the Senate president, it was kind of a come down to be a, huh? a backbencher in the minority. I mean, you know, uh, in, in many ways. Now, I liked being a person having a job where I made the final call. I didn't have to convince somebody else. But I had a lot more influence when I was Bob Blair's aide uh, or working for Senator Arrington. I mean, I had a lot more input on public policy than I did as a freshman legislator. Though I, you know, I, I had bills that passed and, you know, I was involved in some major things, but still it, it was not quite as what I thought it would be. The other problem was uh, I took a pay cut. Uh, I mean, legislators didn't get paid very much back then. And, uh, you know, I'd, we'd taken a pretty good pay cut and uh, we still had a debt left over from, uh, no, we paid the debt off before I ran, yeah. College debt? No, campaign debt for the first oh. election. That was another problem after the first election. Because when you have a debt and you win, it's just a cash flow problem. But when you have a debt after a campaign and you lose, it's a debt. And one thing Brenda did make me promise, that I would never get us in debt again over a campaign. Uh, if I was going to run, make sure I raised the money and, you know, didn't put us in. But we didn't have any savings. So... I think it was that was a challenge because money was always a problem because, uh, you know, we lived from paycheck to paycheck. You know, when Governor Quinn vetoed the legislative pay raise a few months ago, I mean, I can't imagine how some poor freshman rank and file legislator would be able to to mm -hmm. live because we lived from paycheck to paycheck and uh, it it was a challenge. Brenda had to, you know, really watch the the pennies and uh, you know I was gone most of the time and. Uh, Fortunately, we had a per diem over here, so I could come over here and eat pretty well. Uh, but uh, I tried to save some of that, so, you know, when I got home, we could eat too. Well, this reminds me of some of the changes that uh, Arrington himself helped introduce to the legislative process in the state, and that kind of was the change from being the, the citizen legislator who always had some kind of other job back in the home district, another source of income, who would just pick up a small stipend from his legislative job to being more of the professional yeah. legislator. They did, and still many of the legislators still had jobs back, but I didn't. Well, it's easier if you're a lawyer to have yeah. that kind of an experience. Or you had your business set up and maybe you know somebody could run it. Or uh, Now, Brenda, I, while she always thought it would be interesting to have a Merle Norman cosmetic studio, and one came available in Charleston right when I got elected state rep, and this is a small cosmetic, uh, sells cosmetics, and uh, so she thought that my, and we, we both thought, well, that'd be good, that'd be something she could do, and a part-time job, make some money. Well, we got another education on being in retail. Small business is not, uh, <laughs> you don't make your fortune in small business. Yeah, we didn't ever make any money, and it turned out she, it was a full-time job for her. So she, she also tried to deal with that while I was a legislator mm -hmm. trying to make ends meet, and it was, uh, financially, it was a challenge. Uh, the district, too. The other thing, it was really much more relaxing for me in Springfield than when I was home because I always had to be out. And my district was 125 miles long and 70 miles wide. And, you know, every night it seemed like I had to be someplace. Uh, and it seemed every night, if I was at home, right when I took that first bite at supper, the phone would ring. Uh, somebody would mm -hmm. want something. So it was... Uh, it was quite a, a challenge, I think, uh, in, in many ways. And uh, but I, I still enjoyed the being my own man. But uh, I think, from Brenda's perspective, it probably wasn't the best uh, setup that we could have had. Well, I want to move forward to the next big event, and that's I think it's April of 1979, the first time Governor Thompson is going to come knocking at the door. Uh, it was in. Uh, either late January, early February. Um, we had, the legislature had gone back into session, but we weren't doing anything the first month. And uh, he had, he called me one night and I was gone. I was out at some function and I got home and Brenda said, the governor called. Well, I was mad at him. We'd got into a 
disagreement over their legislative pay raise, which is a whole long involved story that anyway made being a state legislator pretty unpleasant because I was one of the few who had voted for it. And then he'd kind of gone back on his commitment and he wanted to roll it back. And we got into, many in the legislature and the governor got into a pretty big uh, fight and I was very upset with him. And so I didn't want to call him back. I figured he was just calling me because he wanted to make peace and I just didn't want to do that. I remember Brenda said, he's the governor, you're calling him back. <laughs> so I called him back. And uh, he offered me a job, which just was a shock to me. He uh, wanted me to become his legislative uh, aide. Uh, the person who had done it, who I'd worked with in Bob Blair's office, wanted to go do something else. And apparently they had made several recommendations to him, and he didn't like him. And he said he wanted somebody who had been a legislator, so he got the list of Republican legislators and settled on my name. And uh, so he, he made a very attractive offer. Uh, among other things, he would, uh, he figured I wanted to run for statewide office, and so he would get me a place on the ticket down the road if I would do this for a couple of years and get him a spot in the cabinet then. And anyway, and I, I said, well, Governor, I really appreciate the offer, and it's very kind of you, but I don't want to do it. You know, I like being a legislator. He said, well, now don't, just don't say no, just think about it next time you're in Springfield. Well, I hung up, and I turned to Brenda and told him, tell her what he'd said. She says, take the job. <laughs> okay. Now, you, he's already kind of uh, given us a window into your thoughts at the time. Why were you so adamant about taking the job? I was ready to, to be done with this political side of um, his life. You know, he'd been elected and he'd been a representative. and Plus, we had the pay raise issue and you were afraid of yes, it. Yes, it, there was a lot of things happening because it does affect, you know, the family as well as what the legislature, how they vote on issues. Um, and I was ready just to get out of that district and return to Springfield. Okay. So I, I was think, excited. Though, that by that time you certainly knew plenty of people in the Charleston area. But oh, I knew a lot of people and I had great friends there. It wasn't that. It was more uh, just the... The legislative pay raise, I, since I was one of the few that voted for it, it just blew up downstate. And people, I mean, nasty articles in the paper, people would say things to you. And I, Brenda was afraid to go out of the house. Uh, almost. In I was a little sensitive to people's <laughs> comments, so I, I was ready to leave she, that environment. And, I well, th and she also, the idea of going back to Springfield, because yeah. she enjoyed yeah. Springfield. Well, I, we don't need to get into it now, but I would encourage people to look into the whole idea of the, the, uh, the legislative pay raise that ended up in the cutback amendment and dramatically changed Illinois history thereafter. And brought us back when? Yeah, brought us Pat Quinn. That's yeah. where he entered into the fray. But I don't want to get too deeply yeah, yeah, into no. that one here. But the uh, Brenda really thought I ought to do it. She thought for a lot of reasons. And uh, and I, I didn't want to do it. And so I called some of my friends who had helped me got elected, and I knew they would reinforce that I ought to stay where I was. Every one of them said, take the job. Being a state legislator is a dead end, they thought. Well, and if you've got a statewide aspiration, you're networking with everybody. Yeah, though I, most of them didn't know really if Governor Thompson would really do that. You know, that means so, the Get me on the promise. ticket, get on my ticket, get him on. Yeah, something could happen. But they thought if I went and worked, because the, the possibility after two years of being legislative liaison, then going into the cabinet, they thought that was a great springboard to some good job. And so they thought that made a lot of sense. And uh, so I, I began to, what I don't often do is change my mind. Uh, because I realized that maybe I'd looked at this wrong and uh, so we talked about it and then I still hadn't got back to the governor and I'm over in Springfield for a session and I get this call from him. He says, are you in town? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, you haven't come by to see me. And I said, eh. He said, I'm sending my car to come and get you. I'm come over to the mansion. So well, I'd quickly written down a list of things I wanted. I mean, I figured he wanted me. So this was a, I had a little leverage <laughs> with the governor. and. Uh, you know, I had my salary set, I wanted, and how much they get, you know, all this and that. And so I go over, and Thompson, there's nobody better at sweet talking to you than Jim Thompson. I mean, he could, you know, uh, and he had, we were in the library, which turned out to be, when I was governor, one of my favorite rooms. He had the fire going. It was, you know, it was, it was a cold February day. And, uh, and it's so, all very calculated. <laughs> oh, and, and I mean, he had, I mean, he, he was a pro at it. And, and it wasn't just me, he had worked on many times. But, uh, so we get in there and, you know, he, he goes through his, uh, well, I think, you know, I, I think 
you're like me. You, no, he said, I, th I think you're, you know, I've always thought you would like to be governor someday. And I looked at him, I said, no, I'm like you. I want to be president someday. You know, I was <laughs> trying to keep him off balance a little bit. And, uh, but we had a talk. And he said he really wanted me to come. And he said, you know, I, they told me other people I didn't want them. And I knew from talking to the staff that he really wanted me to do this. And, uh, and I think it was because I had stood up to him. I mean, I think he, he told me later, he said, I, didn't, I knew that if you would tell me the truth. And I knew you'd tell me what you thought I needed to hear. And that was kind of the relationships we, we had, which was, was very, very rewarding. I mean, I'd worked for other people, and I was a little apprehensive about it. But he was a, probably as good a person I'd ever worked with. And I, Senator Arrington was a great person, but I was always scared of him. Uh, Governor Thompson, though, was somebody I, I learned to, uh, I could tell him what I thought, and he'd listen. And often he would follow my advice. Sometimes he wouldn't. But least paranoid person I ever met in politics. So anyway, we were sitting over that day, and I have my list, and I go through it, and he said, I don't think I've ever had somebody come in for a job. I said, well, you're, you want me, remember? <laughs> I said, you know, <laughs> and he agreed to everything. He said, now, you got to go talk to my chief of staff, Jim Fletcher. He'll work it out, and, but, uh, you know, we, we agreed. And, uh, and then, I, you know, I called Brendan. I said, well, we've worked it out. We're going to do this. Well, I think the next week, Brenda, she drove over with me to go find a house. She, was, she wanted to move. Time to move again. <laughs> Where did you look this time? Well, I had a, a good friend um, who was a realtor in Springfield, and she knew what our needs were. And so our main concern was um, we wanted our kids to be in a, a smaller school district. So we looked in the Chatham School District, but happened that we were in the Springfield city limits. And so we found a, the perfect place for our family to go to school and grow up. What was the neighborhood? It's called Hyde Park. So it's a little bit west of the uh, the lake area then? It's off of yes. Toronto yeah. Road. Just, it's, it's a little west of the university. The campus is out there. And uh, it was a small, had a tennis court, which was unheard with lights. And I love to play tennis. And this was not a upscale uh, subdivision. It was middle class. But uh, I remember we went out there. And uh, I don't even know if we looked at well, other houses. Places, OK, but we walked into the house. We, I mean, I, we walked in the door. And this house was going to cost a little more than the other house. Uh, but I'd got a pretty good salary from Thompson, so I thought I could, you know, I could afford it. But I remember walking in the door with Brenda, and I said, in my mind, this is the house she's going to say. And, you know, in about two seconds, we knew that's the house we wanted. And it turned out to be a great place to, to live. We lived there for 12 years, 12 years and our kids mm -hmm. really grew up there. And, uh, Did, was Elizabeth already of school age at that she time? She was in um, first grade, and Brad um, was in sixth grade at that time, so... They had a, it was a great neighborhood to grow up in and great schools. And, and like you say, that's the, that's the house that they remember as young oh kids. Oh, yes, right. That, that was probably, a, I always try to think, did we have a normal time? Because I was always out running and doing. In many ways, that was probably about as normal. Look, there's a year maybe in Charleston I thought was kind of normal. But this was probably the, by far the most normal. Uh, we were there for 12 years. Uh, we had neighbors that were friends that we did things together. We still do things with. Uh, and, you know, every night I, when I worked for the governor, then later when I became secretary of state, often I'd get home late at night and there was a, a guy in the neighborhood who would always come and play tennis with me at 11 o'clock at night. I think the neighbors probably didn't care for that, but we had the lights on and we'd play. And it, it was just a, an ideal place to, to well, be. Well, I know one of the neighbors was Sherry Strzok. Right. And she and her husband, but she became your secretary, your personal assistant once you became governor? I, I call it secretary. I don't think we call them those anymore, but yeah. that she was my right hand. And really, it was Brenda and her got to be good friends. I knew Earl. First week we moved in, they had a potluck there, the association in the neighborhood. And they had just moved in, and I knew Earl from the legislature. He was lobbying, and so we spoke. Well, Brenda and Sherry, that's the first time they met. Well, they became very close friends. And uh, so, you know... 12 or 8 years, 10 years later, when I'm running for governor, I remember I told Sherry, I said, Sherry, I think it's time for you to move from the Coal Association over to run my, the governor's uh, campaign office. And then, well, let's take one step back, though, yeah. but I wanted to move on to the next time Governor Thompson has a fateful conversation with you because of another series of events that you had no control over. But again, it's all about timing. Well, it? Governor Thompson had indicated he wanted to find a place on the ticket and you know, you never know if that's what's going to happen. Well, lo and behold, about 
a month after I went to work for him, Adley Stevenson announced he wasn't going to run for re-election to the U.S. Senate. And Alan Dixon, who was the Secretary of State, announced he was going to run for that, which meant if he won, that would create a vacancy. Now, nobody knew who Governor Thompson would pick if there was a vacancy, but that created a vacancy. And a uh, year and a half later, Alan Dixon wins the Senate seat, and that office is open. And Governor Thompson had me down and said, would you be interested? I said, oh, yeah, I'd be interested. Well, we'd also begin to have discussions about me possibly running for lieutenant governor the next time around. And uh, he said, well, would you rather be lieutenant governor? Would you rather be secretary of state? And I said, well, you don't have the lieutenant governor to offer right now. And a bird in a hand's worth two in the bush. And so, uh, and, but he didn't know if he just said, well, I just, I said, but, you, you know, you don't owe it to me or you don't owe it to anybody. Just, you know, whoever you think makes the most sense. So. I didn't hear anything for two or three weeks. There was a lot of speculation in the paper and, you know, uh, about what was going to happen. And Plenty of other people wanted oh, that Oh, yeah, job. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, they did. And I remember Jim coming home saying, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to get that. And I said, well, why do you think that? And he said, well, I would have heard by now. I'm sure I would have heard by now. Well, that was on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, we knew he, he was going to have to. This had drug up for a long time, and he had to make a choice. And George Ryan was interested. He was the name being mentioned. There were some women being mentioned. There hadn't been any women in state office up to that point. So uh, there were, and some congressmen that wanted it uh, had come back and talked to him. So I figured I hadn't heard anything. And I thought he was, the word around the office was he's going to make a decision soon. And so I remember going home Friday night and Brenda wanted me to stop by and get some milk. And I remember getting a gallon of milk, put it on top of my car while I unlocked the car. I was so upset. I forgot the milk was still on top of the car, and I drove away <laughs> to go home and uh, had to go back and get another gallon of milk. But <laughs> got home that night, and uh, we still watch Washington Week in Review. It's one of the few programs over the years we watch on Friday night at 7 o'clock on PBS. And remember, I was sitting there watching it, and the phone rang. And Brenda answered, and she looked at me, and I don't think she said it a lot. She just said, the Governor. And I figured, well, he's calling to tell me, sorry, I'm, I'm going to pick somebody else, but we'll talk about the Lieutenant Governor or something like that. So I get on the phone. He said, uh, you still want to be Secretary of State? And I said, yes. He says, it's yours. And uh, I remember I, I hung up. I looked at Brenda. I said, I'm going to be Secretary of State, and we got to get an unlisted phone number. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, why did you say that, Governor? Well, I knew Secretary of State next to the Governor has got all the jobs. And you Patronage. Get, yeah. You gotta be, and what happened, I, we did get rid of our number, and the telephone company gave it to some poor person who just moved into Springfield. <laughs> oh, God. And he just got inundated, and finally he got rid of it. Uh, but uh, that was on a Friday night, and I was to come up on Monday to uh, talk it over with him, then we are going to announce it Tuesday in Springfield. And, and he was going to meet with George Ryan and tell him that it was going to be me uh, on Saturday. And he wasn't really looking forward to that meeting, but he... He, uh, he called me Sunday night. I said, well, I had the meeting. Everything's set. Are you coming up tomorrow? Yeah. And I said, I'll be up. So I get up, and we talk about, you know, how we're going to handle it and everything. And uh, then on Tuesday, this Tuesday before Thanksgiving, uh, we have the announcement in the uh, uh, Blue Room at the State Capitol. And uh, life changed for me probably as much as any time in my life and just continued to change. Probably not as much for Brenda, but, uh, you know, then I was sworn in. I was the only new state office holder that following January. I think January 5th was when Alan Dixon was sworn in the U.S. Senate, so I got sworn in as Secretary of State. But uh, for me, that was uh, th that was quite a change uh, because now I was in one of the most visible offices next to the governor, probably the most visible office in state government. Uh, I was, uh, you know, if I handled it right, I would have a good shot at governorship. But at that time, most people didn't think I'd make it out of a primary because I was this unknown kid. I was 34 years old. So you, you were going to have to turn right around and actually run for this I was going to have to campaign, start right away. And, uh, you know, this was in January, and the, the primary wouldn't be till the following year, but I knew I had to get a, you know, quick start, so I'd discourage anybody wanting to run against me in the primary. And also I knew how you started first impressions were huge in how people are going to perceive you. So I had to kind of went over all the party people. Now, one of the raps on me, one of the, I remember somebody came to talk to me and says, you know, I think Thompson would like to name you Secretary of State, but he's worried you're not political enough. 
the party people want somebody that's political, particularly in that office. And I always thought I was pretty political. Uh, but uh, I also, you know, I, I wanted to do things in government. Political versus what? Somebody who's focused on policy? Policy, yeah. yeah. And I thought I, I, I knew both. But I was always kind of the political guy working on the legislative staffs. Uh, but one of the problems we had right off was that Alan Dixon uh, had got a, a merit code passed and coded in all his Democratic employees. And that had just happened. And so you had 3,500 of the best Democrats in the state of Illinois working in the Secretary of State's office. Well, all the Republican county chairman wanted me to go in there and get rid of them and hire their guys. And I had a meeting with them, and I told them I'm up front. I think it was even before I swore in it. I said, guys, I'm not going to break the law. They're, as long as they do their job, I'm not going to fire them. Now, if they don't do their job, that's another thing. Oh, they were mad at me. They said, well, the Democrats should do that. And I said, I'm not going to break the law. Just, you know. And now, if there's an, back then, if there was an opening, you could hire a Republican. I mean, it wasn't as, as um, the laws aren't as strict as they are today. Uh, but I said, I, I'm, you know, if I get a vacancy and you give me somebody qualified, I'll hire him. But I'm not going to go fire a Democrat just because he's a Democrat and have to spend all my time in court fighting over it. And so they weren't. So I knew I had that problem. So I had to kind of still win them over. And uh, in January, February, and March, Republicans have. Lincoln Day dinners. Lincoln's birthday is February 12th, but we celebrate it for months. And I knew this is their main, and I knew this from my days as a state rep. This is when they raise most of their money. And this is very important. So if they get a speaker that's good or somebody that can draw, this is important to them. Well, I was, we had a new attorney general, new secretary of state, and they, they asked me, they asked him. They really wanted me more because I had jobs. So that, I mean, that's, you know, and it, it Attorney General didn't mean that much to him, but Secretary of State did because we had offices throughout the state too. And uh, so I think I did about 45 Lincoln Day dinners. So right off the bat, I'm gone every night. Every night. But, and Brenda, so Brenda's home. Uh, it's kind of like being a legislator again, except we had a lot nicer home and uh, pay was a little better. Uh, well, Brenda, what did the kids think about their dad being the Secretary of State? Did it even register with them what that position was or who he was, that he was important. Yeah, it did register with uh, especially Brad in, in junior high and uh, when Jim would go to basketball games, you know, he had security with him. So that was kind of a, a buzz for adolescents to think that, you know, there'd be a security person with your dad. Uh, Elizabeth was younger, so she knew, but uh, both of them had their friends prior to Jim's becoming Secretary of State, so they weren't really treated different. They didn't move into town as the son and daughter of the Secretary of State. They came to town just as Brad and Elizabeth, and so that was that was a really helpful thing for both of them. But at the same time, their friends knew that there was something different, and so the kids they, did, did they too. they think it was kind of a cool thing? I thought it was cool, but I also would constantly be, you know, you have to be good because you can't get in trouble. <laughs> they, uh, I, the other thing, too, we're in the Chatham School District. That's the suburb of Springfield. I mean, it's a very political community. A lot of the kids they went to school with, parents worked in the government, were involved in politics. So I think it probably, it was, a, it was more of a factor, the fact I was Secretary of State because they were going to Chatham and if I'd have been back in Charleston in some ways. Uh, Particularly when I ran for governor, it got to be a real issue, I think, with Elizabeth. But uh, they, I thought they handled it well. They, you know, they got to do some things they didn't get to do. They, they get to go to Chicago. Now, they right away realized sometimes they got stuck doing some political things. It's so no all fun. <laughs> but uh, they did get to like go. Like being in parades and yeah, things yeah. like that. But huh? they, they did get to go see some, do some things and travel. and do. They wouldn't have done otherwise. And they got the troopers. I mean, the troopers are like big brothers to them because some of them we had... Right. All yes. the time, they, yeah, we had them for 12, 14 years, and so they, the kids grew up around those troopers, and they were very, the troopers were always very good to them. I mean, they would, uh, you know, I remember we'd, one time we went down to Florida. We didn't often take them out of state, but one time we did, and I remember one of the troopers took Brad fishing, you know. And he, I mean, he'd go to all the football. He'd always be on the detail the night I had football games. He watched all of Brad's football games. So, you know, it was like family, and so I, the kids, I think, kind of appreciated that, uh, I, I think for the most part, they, 
there was more pluses than minuses, except a few years later when Brad got to be 16. I was going to say, that was kind of a, that was a lot touch of and go, you know, when you're 16 and you're getting ready to get your driver's license. Oh, yes, and dad controlled uh, yes, driver's that's right. license. Yes. I tried to get him to flunk him and they wouldn't, but uh, but he also, I also told him, I said, and he knew, and, and his mother reminded him, you know, you're, you're, you've got your driver's license, but you're the son of the Secretary of State. Be extremely careful, because if you get stopped, it's going to be in the paper. I remember your comment about me. and the, the advantage of being Secretary of State in the state of Illinois, even the kids know who the Secretary oh, yeah. of State they is. Do. Right. Well, the first time, when I ran the first time in 1982, uh, of course, we didn't know what was going to happen, but they started having mock elections around. And back then, they would release the results before the election. They don't, don't do that anymore. You mean in the schools? The schools, yeah. And they, they came back and said, you're winning all the high schools. I said, well, of course I'm winning all the high schools. I'm the incumbent Secretary of State. They don't care who the governor is, but they sure know who the Secretary of State is, you know. And uh, of course I'm going to win those things. Uh, but, yeah, it for the I thought the kids handled it well. And, uh, I mean, and they never... They were definitely a, an asset. They never were a liability. Yeah, they were great assets, and they were good. And I, I do. None think of they the kids the ever got a I know stop. What you're say. Never I got know. a traffic violation when I was Secretary of State. Just me. Just my spouse here <laughs> but, did. But let's let's explain why I was stopped. One night. Well, aren't you going to explain? Or are you going to well, let him? Well, I will it? explain to you that I see these two red lights shining in my rearview mirror, and I think they can't be wanting to stop me because I haven't done anything wrong. I wasn't speeding, and but actually he did pull me over. And uh, he came to the window and he said, ma'am, um, you're driving with an expired license plate. Well, I said, oh, because I didn't know that my license plate was expired. But being the wife of the Secretary of State, the first thing, yeah, he took my driver's license and kept it. You know, I guess that's what happens when you get stopped and you get a ticket. So I called Jim as soon as I could get to a phone. He was traveling, of course, away from town. And I said, oh, I just got stopped by the police and they took my driver's license and it might be in the newspaper. And no. he said to me, well, you know, we'll pay the ticket and you'll get your driver's license back. And yeah, it probably will be in the paper. And, and it was. She, uh, she was a little more emotional than she is telling the story now when she called <laughs> I was a little hysterical. <laughs> and uh, I said, it, it'll, it'll be in the paper. Sure enough, front page of the Chicago Sun-Times the next day. But a good politician can actually well, spin this to your advantage. Well, I, I think, think everybody can relate to it. And we paid our fine. I mean, we didn't try to fix the ticket. And, uh, we, you know, but it was just, it was ironic. As much as she preached to those kids, be careful, particularly Brad, who had his driver's license, at that point, Elizabeth didn't have hers yet, and just preached to them about being careful uh, that, I guess Elizabeth did get hers. I was Secretary of State when she got it, too. Yeah. I don't think so, Yeah, because yeah, she was a senior when I got elected governor, so she got it her junior okay. year. Yeah, now she did have a little accident, but that, she, uh, but it would be Brenda that would get it. So I, I always that have to me. remind her of that. Uh, but I think, uh, as far as the family life, family kind of stayed pretty normal. Oh, we did. Uh, we we kind of hung into a very low-key lifestyle. Like you, you were working to maintain that. Oh, yes, we did. But it was, we were in an environment mm -hmm. where we could do that pretty easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now, there were times that they would, you know, they'd go out and do the campaign. I mean, one of the horror stories for Brenda is my that first election for Secretary of State. Uh, I was up in the Chicago area doing a lot of Fourth of July parades. You know, you can do a lot up there, a lot of people. That's how you get to people. She went over to Champaign to do one, and it was a real hot day. And uh, if you're the Secretary of State, you get put in the front of the parade. If you're just the wife of a candidate, you're in the back of the parade. So she was stuck in the back of this parade over in Champaign. It was 110 degrees, and just a f couple weeks before, I had had to arrest a group of women from Champaign-Urbana that were known as the chain gang. They were pro-ERA, and they chained themselves to the Senate chambers to make them do something, and it clogged up everything, and so we'd moved them out to I another... I just interviewed one of those ladies. Did you? Yeah. They, uh, and we just moved them out. Just remember us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We moved them out, and then they came back in and threw blood all over the the chambers. Well, that was it. We had them arrested and thrown in jail. And uh, it was quite a, 
it was the last year of ERA, and it was all happening right in Illinois. And I had it. And as Secretary of State, you're in charge of the Capitol building, so I had to deal with that issue. And, uh, so Brenda's over in Champaign, and well, there's the chain gang and their supporters just harassing her with a lot of verbal comments uh, in that parade. And uh, so she goes through that. Then we had an old Maverick, no air conditioning, and she was going to drive from Charleston down to Charleston. No, on Champaign to Charleston. Cha Champaign to Charleston on what we call the U of I Trail. It's 120. It's a highway, but there's not much there. And it broke down. No, the transmission went out. Of the car. So it was a long 4th of July and there was day for us. The kids phones. were with me. That was before cell What phones. did you yeah. think in the, while you're in the parade having all these, I, I assume these women are haranguing you. Well, they comments uh, something like, you know, your husband puts women in jail and they just kept saying it and finally I turned and said, well, that's what happens when you break the law. And we went on, but it was not a pleasant day for any of us. And then we get into the car and it's still hot and the car doesn't it breaks, breaks down. down and he has, you know, of course, security with him. And she's got to walk to far, she's got to walk half a mile to a farmhouse, farmhouse call right my now. mother. She drives up and gets her, takes her down to Charleston. I'm up in the suburbs having a wonderful time. <laughs> People cheering and all this and that. I call her that night. I'm all pumped up about it. I said, I had a great day. How was yours? Well, then she just unloads on me about how her day was. So Not good. Yeah. So parades were not the favorite thing. Brad also was in that parade. He was carrying the banner and he... He didn't like parades either after that. Uh, well, that there's another you. incident. I don't know if it's the same campaign, but I believe an incident maybe involving a, a plane ride to Moline with Ken Zender, perhaps? Yeah. Was that Let's both see. of That's you or just... Crash. That's a crash The landing. first one? Yeah. Ken was yes. in the plane that day. Yeah. Yeah. That was early on when I was governor. We were going up to Moline to do an event, and Brendan and I and uh, Ken Zender, who was on my staff, and... Uh, yeah, I'll I don't Brenda, really like Brenda to. Brenda I don't her. like to fly, and especially in small planes at that time. And so we took off, and the pilot said we're going to return to the Springfield Airport. We're just going to touch down because the landing gear hadn't retracted. And so we just having a conversation. When we touched down, the landing gear collapsed, and we were skidding along the runway, and we mm. could smell smoke. And um, you know, the fire trucks were coming, and. They just told us, hurry up and get out, you know. Yes. We got out. And we got right out of that plane, and then we it, go it was home. A, even harder then for me to Yeah, We to went fly. home. We went home. and We didn't go to Moline. We, we, I'd had water in the basement, and I was really worried about, what am I going to do about mm -hmm. the water in the basement? It amazed me. When I went home, I didn't worry a bit about that water. I was just glad to be home. And Alive. The kids were there, and we are just staring at the kids, and they said, why are you staring at us? And we said, we're just glad to see you. <laughs> and then that night on the evening news, they had kind of taken us out real quick, and we didn't actually see when the fire trucks got there. But it showed in the evening news the plane all mangled up, the propellers, you know, bent up, and it's over on its side, and the fire trucks are hosing down this plane, and, you know, there's, I don't know if there's smoke or it's foam smoke. coming. But anyway, Brenda just lost it watching it. It was kind of, I think, a after effect. In the well, I want to go, just a couple of quick questions on your your time as Secretary of State, and keep it very general, but I wanted to see if you thought being an executive, being the Secretary of State, was a better fit for you than being a legislator. Oh, I enjoyed it a lot more. You get something done. I mean, I had to watch it when I became Secretary of State. I, you know, I'd say something, I'd go do it, you know. Say something, about, oh, I don't like that door, they'd go replace it. I mean, or, and I had to realize, you know, I had well, I had a lot of Democrats who were worried about their jobs, so they were especially wanted to please me, then I had my people, but in the executive position like that, you can make a decision, have it implemented, and it's done. In the legislature, you have an idea, you try to get a bill passed, then somebody else is going to implement it. And the implementation, as we, we've learned, watching what's happened with health care, uh, that's 80 percent of the, the game. And so as Secretary of State, I could get things done. And while I wasn't dealing in the big, big issues, you know, Traffic safety, uh, we, we dealt with drunk driving. I mean, we changed the whole perception in Illinois. We went from being the weakest state to one of the strongest in the country on fighting drunk driving. Uh, we initiated a literacy program uh, that had very positive impact. So there were things you could do uh, as Secretary of State that I never could get done as a legislator. I want to uh, go to a picture, my favorite picture of the two of you, and I think this is a picture from Colorado. 
and take the story back to Colorado because I think perhaps that's the next important call well, that the, you might yeah, have gotten. The, uh, the third call from Jim Thompson. Uh, exactly. W this is the July of 1989. Uh, no, we're on our way to, we're driving down to St. Louis, catch a plane to Vail, Colorado uh, for the Secretary of State's annual meeting, which I was chairman of. And uh, I get a page, my trooper says, call your secretary. So I call my secretary, she says, call the governor. Call the governor, and the governor says, uh, it's yours. I said, what? He says, I'm announcing I'm not running this afternoon, in about an hour. I said, okay. So I go, Brendan and I get on the plane, and you know, this, we know life's never gonna be the same again. Uh, and so we, we fly out to Colorado, and uh, all the way out, I'm, Thinking uh, before I got on the plane, I called my press secretary, Mike Lawrence, and said, "You know, Thompson just called me, so you you know you can go ahead and the press is going to want to get at me, so you know I'll be landed in three hours and I'll be up at Vail or whatever." So I get land. I called him. I said, "He said well, there's about six TV crews coming to see you." And I said, "All right," but I said, well, "We're going to make a deal with them. They can interview me, but they can't show the mountains because <laughs> I didn't want people to think, well, I'm in Colorado, you know, in a junket, and." Uh, which I was, but anyway, uh, all the TV crews come in, we do the interview, and I mean, from then on, it was just full speed. I mean, we knew flying out that while life had changed for me as Secretary of State, it would begin to change now for Brenda and the kids, because this, this is the big time. I mean, there's only one thing bigger than this, and that's running for President of the United States. But this and, is having uh, an Illinois fish bowl. Oh yeah, this is, the, and uh, you know, this is going to be the, a big time. And we also knew, again, these early hours, these early days were important because we didn't want a primary opponent. George Ryan and, our, our, and I already had an understanding. He probably would run for Secretary of State. I'd run for governor. We'd support each other. Uh, he wouldn't run against me in a primary. Uh, but we didn't know who else might get in. Uh, and we didn't want a primary. Uh, we wanted to have a clean shot to the general election because we thought Neil Harding was going to have a clean shot, the attorney general, who I was going to have to run against. Uh, so, but I'm running this meeting too at Vail. It's, you were president yeah. of the Chairman, National yeah. Association of Secretary of State, so it was kind of a, a finale uh, party it turned out to be. Yeah. We didn't no. know it when we were headed that direction, but. Mrs. Edgar, I would assume by this time, you knew that he had a real passion for going after that job, but what was your reaction hearing the news that uh, Thompson wasn't going to be running again, and he was throwing, throwing it uh, his direction? Well, by that point in our life, I, I was ready for that challenge uh, as much as one can be ready. You, you really have no idea what you're entering, but I knew that that was... Uh, you know, Jim's hope to get the opportunity to run for governor, and I thought it was it was a good timing in the ages of the kids. Um, so I was excited for Jim. Our our old our youngest daughter Elizabeth was a senior, going to be a senior in high school, and Brenda had never wanted me to be governor, and have the kids live in the mansion. She just didn't think it was a, the best place for the kids to grow up. In fact, Jim Thompson always claimed he told the Rockford editorial board the reason he ran the last time, for his fourth term, was because Brenda Edgar said we're not ready yet. Well, I told Brenda about six months before this all happened, I said, would you go tell Governor Thompson we're ready now? Because I said, you know. And, Jim was ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but, uh, you know, she, no, she, I think she knew it was going to happen. She was supportive. And, uh, but I don't think any of us had an appreciation how much more this was a change than even being Secretary of State. It's an and enormous her, change. Um, more than, as Jim said, that either one of us could have imagined. But how so? That, well, you're oh, constantly the in the media. Yeah. You, anything you said very well is going to appear on the front page of the Chicago Tribune. And it could be misinterpreted. Now, Secretary of State, I used to be able to babble about a lot of things. I didn't pay any attention. But uh, I learned very quickly as, as a candidate for governor, anything I said, anything I did uh, would, would be interpreted, and sometimes wrongly, uh, but it make a great news story. Uh, so, and also, people wanted you here, they wanted you there, uh, you had to be there right away. Uh, there was all kinds of pressures that you really hadn't, we particularly hadn't felt probably since the first race for Secretary mm -hmm. of State. Uh, then, while we are in Colorado, uh, Don Rumsfeld, later Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld, uh, made some noise he might want to run for governor. That was out of left field. And, 
Uh, so we were worried about that. And after about two days, that he decided he really didn't want to worry about bridges in Saline County. I mean, he, you know, that wasn't his thing. And uh, so once he said he wasn't going to run, I, I felt pretty comfortable. Now I did get a primary opponent, somebody from the far right, uh, that was a nuisance. But I, I never worried about him beating me in the primary. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of a, a nuisance that we had to deal with. Uh, but the, uh, the, the initial, initially everything went very well. We we quickly got the support of the party. Uh, we planned our announcement. Uh, we did a fly around in August, formally announcing, uh, and it, you know we had huge crowds every place we went. I mean, we we'd have thousand people. So this is August of eighty nine. Eighty nine, and this is still almost a year and four months before the election. But it was full speed at that point, and it was full speed all the way until election night. And uh, again, I think, uh, and the family was very much involved. Brenda particularly uh, was out you know, several days a week campaigning. Uh, and again, it was just, it was different from the Secretary of State. Uh, but it was, I also knew it was going to be a tough race. So again, I was uptight. I mean, I worried about any little mistake might cost us the election. Now, we made a lot of mistakes, but fortunately, so did the other side, you know, and uh, it all worked out. Well, Mrs. Edgar, you talked before that he sometimes would come home and he'd he, you'd be able to tell his emotions at the time. Was this a tougher time to be married then, dealing with the, the intensity of the election? Well, it was extremely in, intense, and his mood was not the greatest, but he was gone a great deal of the time, so I didn't see him so much. Well, let me tell you another thing, too, that we had not talked about. Uh, Brenda did not appreciate when we'd go out and do things, I'd kind of leave her. And, you know, I'd go work a crowd or whatever, and she'd get left because she just, and uh, so after I stopped being a state rep, she said, I don't want to do that anymore. Well, some uh, state rep from Springfield had invited me to come to his fundraiser. Thompson was to be the speaker. And so I had Brenda. She says, I don't want to, she says, but you stay with me. I said, don't worry. I'm, we're just going as guests. We're not going to do anything. We walk in. Thompson had canceled. And the guy came in and says, you got to be the speaker. And you got to come into my VIP room. And he grabs me and I'm off. And Brenda gets left. Well, I go into VIP, I get up and talk, then that's over, and I go look for Brenda. I can't find her anyplace. And I walk outside, the car's not there. <laughs> well, Brenda had taken the car and gone home, because she said, you had promised. <laughs> and I learned from that. So when I became Secretary of State, and when I was governor, I made sure whenever we went to some function, somebody on the staff was assigned to take care of Brenda, to make sure she didn't get left alone. Well, by the time I got to run for governor, she was kind of a star on her own. I mean. She would go places on her own. We didn't all often go to places together. I mean, she, she was too important an asset to waste with me. She would go on her own. But I, I think I, I did a much better job when I was Secretary of State and Governor to make sure she wasn't left on her own than I had been mm -hmm. a state rep. And uh, so, and she, you know, she had her own people with her, and uh, she had a traveling aide and. Uh, somebody she felt comfortable with, and uh, but Brenda did a very good job out. Uh, Barbara Bush had, had, when she went around for President Bush the first election, she showed a slideshow of the family. It was, it was kind of a nice way to talk the, about the, the family. The 88 election? Yeah. A nice way to show talk about the family and not have to make a speech. And so Brenda adopted that in the 90 mm -hmm. campaign and, and went around and showed a slideshow on the Edgar family. Well, Mrs. Edgar, you've already told us that you didn't like parades, especially after that one incident, and probably didn't like the flying part. Was there any part of campaigning that you did like? What any? would be the best part of it? Well, you did meet a, a lot of very nice people, um, and it, it took a lot of very nice people to win uh, the state of Illinois. Uh, you know, there's it's a very diverse state, so it was it was a fun learning experience to meet people all over the state and actually after we left the governor's mansion and you know, we were so accustomed to seeing people all over the state then suddenly we didn't see those people anymore because we weren't traveling to you know all every place in the state so the people and their dedication and their willingness to to help a candidate uh, it was uh, very rewarding were you expected to go out and give speeches? And, and I did that. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy that part of it? I learned to. <laughs> I, 
I, I have never, dread or tolerate it. <laughs> yeah, I have never liked the part when there is a camera and a microphone. Those are the two parts. Uh, almost right up there with disliking parades and flying were microphones and cameras. So those were things I wanted to avoid as much as I could. I remember you got caught one time saying something that almost got you in, in some trouble. Well, that's and probably it, more than once. I'm not <laughs> sure which one. Well, I think this had something to do with his health, perhaps. Oh, when I thought it was off the record, probably. Is that right? Well, I'm trying to remember the specifics about whether or not he would be running again, perhaps, or? I think so. Do you remember that, No, Jim? I was probably out then. I don't remember that. I do. Did you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well. I was just the, uh, making an announcement someplace, uh, and I, someone asked me, a reporter, something about your health. And I don't know what I, I, I did say something that. She was good. By the time I got in the car, somebody was calling me to say, did you just say? And I thought, oh, I guess I did just say. It, she didn't make many mistakes. Uh, but I did She was very some. good. People, uh, I made mistakes. In the, in the governor's race, I think uh, sh she was a huge asset. And by the second time I ran, she was an old pro at it. I mean, she, I had my heart surgery then. She fell in a lot of times. But the first time, she, it, there's no doubt, she was like deer in front of the headlights when we started out. By, by the end of the campaign, she was, she was very good at it. And was a huge help because uh, people want to see the family. Uh, Brad was involved in that campaign. He had graduated from college, had some time off, and he went around, spent times on college campuses, and you know, in in again, showed the the family, mm -hmm. and that's very important. And then uh, Elizabeth in the second campaign was involved. Uh, so the the family really, I thought, was a huge asset in in all my efforts, uh, even though that they didn't necessarily like it. Elizabeth probably liked it the most. She's kind of like me. She she likes politics, but uh, the other two they were good. They were good troopers. They you know, you do out. what you need to do to make something good happen, and and the good that happened was Jim became governor, and now he was a good governor. Now and the night I won, I remember uh, Brenda couldn't do this, but Brad came up and said, "Dad, congratulations, I'm out of here," <laughs> 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 and he left. Well, you and I had a very extended conversation about that 1990 campaign. You described it as one of the classic gubernatorial campaigns, and I certainly would agree with you on that. So I would encourage people to check it out if we want to, if they want to, right. to, to find out a lot more about that. Yeah, 90, 90 I think everybody that's involved would say that was the classic because mm -hmm. we... Let's talk about the moment, though. Finding out, and this was late in the night, as you explained in, in some detail, the moment of finding out that you were finally victorious. Well, you know, the election was nip and tuck back and forth. And then President Bush, I started to pull away about three weeks before the election. And then two weeks before the election, President Bush went back on read my lips and raise taxes. And things just plummeted for us. And I thought we were going to lose. Now, Brenda kept trying to tell me, no, we, we got a chance. But I thought we were beat. So the last two weeks, I was very depressed going through the campaign. And uh, then on election day, we, we get to s Chicago after we'd voted in Springfield. And I guess I'd voted in Charleston. I got home and voted in Charleston. Then we flew up from Springfield. And my one of my press aides caught me on the tarmac at Miggs Airfield and said, exit polls have you up six points. I think, well, great. At least I'm not going to get wiped out because I thought I was going to get wiped out. And uh, then the final exit poll, which we knew would get tighter, had me up one and a half percent, which I'd never heard of a half percent. But anyway, I knew at least I was in the ball game. And early in the returns, mainly from Chicago, I was getting beat pretty bad. And we had this VIP reception, and uh, everybody would come up to us and say, no matter what happens, you ran a good race. Where was this? This was in the, at the Hyatt in Chicago, where our, our election night was. And Brenda, all of a sudden she was gone. And I go back in our room, and she's crying. I said, what's wrong? She said, we're going to lose, aren't we? And I said, no. I said, you know, for two weeks, I've been saying we're going to lose. I now think we're going to win because I had checked. I did a quick check around with precincts from around the state, and I could tell we were running well enough. I thought we were going to hold on. Well, and there's somebody in the campaign who always knows the numbers, always knows all the local districts. Well, and, uh, we, we, we had enough people placed around the state that we could get results from courthouses before AP did, and we, we knew how it kind of weighted in our mind. And... Uh, so, you know, and I also knew in Chicago while we're getting beat, we're not getting as beat as bad as Republicans usually do. So about, I remember about 12 o'clock, they still hadn't, the networks hadn't given the, us the election, which meant Hardigan hasn't conceded. And everybody's still nervous as can be. 
Well, we were ahead by about one o'clock, and we were far enough ahead, there weren't enough votes out for us to lose. So I said, I knew a guy that had worked for us that was in the network headquarters out east where they were making the calls on election. I said, get a hold of Bob Teeters and tell him to look at Illinois again, because we're going to win this race. There's not enough votes out to beat us, and it's, if they don't hurry up and declare us the winner, it's going to be too late to have a party, and the next four years is going to be miserable. This is the only fun we're going to have. So about 20 minutes later, all the networks come on and say, there's been a change in Illinois. Edgar has pulled ahead and is going to be the next governor of Illinois. Neil Harding calls, very gracious, concedes, and then that's the moment. We're going downstairs, and we're upstairs at the top of the Hyatt. We're going down, and everybody's on the main floor at the Hyatt, the Regency downtown, and there's an escalator you take down the last floor. And we're at the top of that escalator, and I'm looking down this sea of people who for hours had been worried we were going to lose. And a lot of them had stuck their neck out. Some of them were Democrats who were for us in that Chicago. And they were just beside themselves because we were won. And so we're up above, and we're going down, and you're seeing all these people being delirious because we had made it. And that, all I said, is the high point of my political career. I mean, that was the greatest feeling that I've ever experienced in politics was that escalator ride down to the main floor at the Hyatt that night. And uh, I don't know about Brenda felt, but I, I, was, I was a pretty happy camper at that point. Well, Mrs. Edgar, your view of that night. Well, it was extraordinary, and it was exciting, and everybody was just beyond happy. But I think the first moment that it became a reality to me was after the inauguration, after Jim had been sworn in, we were going to get in the car to go to the mansion, and the license plate had one governor. And at that moment, I thought, he's governor. Well, so but, that was my yeah. moment of... The other, the other moment was a few weeks later, the governor's conference in the winter is always in Washington, D.C., and one of the things we do is go to the White House. And I remember we go over to the White House, and here are he, President Bush is the president, and he has his cabinet there. So I see all these people I've seen on TV and everything, and then I see some other big-name governors. And there's this big horse or square table with names of all these important people. And I look down, and there's my name. And I thought, <laughs> I'm at the table. I've made it. And I think those two moments are probably the two moments that, uh, you know, you, all that work, all that stress and everything, uh, you know, that, that was the payoff. And that was really, that was worth it, it felt like, at that point. But just a few minutes ago, Governor, you alluded that once you got to the job, it was going to be miserable. I think that's the phrase you it used. It was. It was. The first, it I was. mean, I, it was. <laughs> it I mean, was. the first, first two years, state was broke. Uh, I had a Democratic legislature. They didn't want me in because it was redistricting year. They wanted a Democrat that signed their map. Uh, you know, I would barely won. I didn't have a mandate. Most people didn't know you know, is this kid from downstate going to be able to do this? And, you know, Jim Thompson had been a very successful, very flamboyant, bigger-than-life kind of person. That wasn't Jim Edgar. And so I think a lot of people were just, well, is this a fluke? How's he, you know, he's in? How, how's this going to work? And, uh, you know, Mike Madigan was going to teach me a lesson. I, I'd heard, I'd got word that he was going to show me who was boss, and we had a go at it. And it was, uh, I mean, there were weeks and months when I was the only guy on my side. I mean, even Republican legislators had deserted me because some of the cuts I had to make and uh, trying to get a tax reenacted. I mean, it was not a real easy first session. Were there protests session. going on oh, yeah. even in I, Springfield? At the I, I had every probably interest group that got money from the state at some time protesting outside my office because I was cutting budgets right and left. And they would be beating drums. They'd come to the mansion. Making chants. Yeah. Um, and Jim would be getting dressed and he would be in a not so good mood and he say, you don't understand Brenda this is the going to be the worst day of my life <laughs> but he said that many times <laughs> during those first well one time I, one time I'm giving the, the budget address and it's a grim budget address and some protesters get on the floor and rush me and now I wasn't too worried but it, that just never happened before uh, our dog we had a dog uh, a white uh, half golden half pomper uh, half uh, Samoyan so she was white uh, we had demonstrations around the mansion and she came in, she had lipstick all around her neck. Somebody had grabbed her and put lipsticks around her. I mean, you know, and there were just things like that that you, you kind of put up with those first couple of years. Uh, but after the first session, 
when we kind of got the budget the way we wanted it and we got the tax extended and the speaker and I kind of came to an understanding that he understood that I was probably going to stand firm on things. It got a lot better, but it still took a few years to get out of the financial mess we were in. Second term was much easier. Mm -hmm. I think Brenda, I mean, of course, I went through the, the open heart surgery, running for re-election in 94, uh, and Brenda had to step in and do a lot of the campaigning at that point. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation form to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.